All right, I want you to go in your Bibles tonight to one verse of Scripture. I'm, I'm only going to preach two verses of Scripture. I know you don't believe me, but I am. I'm going to break down, break down Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I will refer to a couple of other Scriptures that I'll put on the screen for you. But almost everything I'm going to talk about is in, well, everything I am going to talk about, the entire outline. So if you have that, you have my outline. We're going to talk about God's plan for losing weight. And um, before we get to that verse, let me say a few things about losing weight. I run into people all the time who have lost a lot of extra weight. And almost without exception, every time I talk to them, they will say things like, I feel so much better. That's one of the first things out of their mouth. I, since I, I got rid of this extra weight, I just feel so much better. They also say, I can do things that I wasn't able to do before. Have you ever heard somebody say that? I can do things like see my feet or whatever it is. You know, it's, it's different levels for different people, you know. So I can do things that I could not do before. I have heard lots of them say this. I mean, over and over, I can't count the many times that someone who's lost a lot of extra weight has said to me, I have gone off almost all of my medications. Well, there's a great motive right there, right? I've gone, almost, almost, I've gone off, off, off of almost all of my medications, and I have lost count of how many times I've heard someone who lost extra weight say, I am no longer a type 2 diabetic. It's completely gone. I take no insulin. It's completely gone. I lost this weight, and that went away. As a matter of fact, I've heard people say lots of things have gone away once they chose to live a healthy life. I've heard them say things like, my blood pressure is normal. I've heard them say things, I can do things I haven't done in years. I just feel better all over. Now, if you've ever heard someone who's lost extra weight make one of those comments before, raise your hand. All right, so this is a sentiment of people who have gotten healthier and lost some extra weight in their bodies. But see, you have more than one type of body. That is a physical body that I'm describing and talking about right now. People that are needing to get healthy, giving their heart a break and their lungs a break and their kidneys a break and, and their liver a break and their pancreas a break. You know, all of those things that we do when we allow ourselves to get healthier. But you have another type of body which is very much comparable to the physical body. And that is your spirit body. You have another body that also carries extra weight. And just like your normal body, when you carry extra weight in your spiritual body, there are things you cannot do. There are things you can't do for years. There are, there are things that make you feel bad. As a matter of fact, if you carry the wrong kind of weight in your spirit, you will never feel good. Have you ever met somebody that everything's a battlefield and everything's the devil's fault? I mean, that's a person carrying a lot of spiritual baggage because my Bible tells me the joy of the Lord is my strength. My Bible tells me there's a peace that passes all understanding that will keep your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. My Bible tells me that we can live in Canaan now. We don't have to go to heaven to get victory. My Bible tells me there's victory through the cross and there's victory through the resurrection. Yes, heaven is the ultimate victory, but you can live in victory now. My Bible tells me that even if I walk to the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. He is with me. His rod and his staff will comfort me. He'll even give me a table in the presence of my enemies and anoint my head with oil right there in the middle of the shadow of death. That's what victorious living looks like. But what happens when we don't have a free spirit? What happens when we've allowed baggage to enter our spirit and we're weighted down? And let me tell you, the same way you feel weighted down physically, you will also feel weighted 
down spiritually. I have, I've lost my joy. I have no peace. I'm doubting all the time. I don't know if I believe in prayer. I'm doubting the existence of God. I just feel like there's no, get the Elijah syndrome. There's no one left but me. You know, everybody's bound to bell. There's just no hope. And that's what happens when your spirit is carrying weight, carrying baggage. You literally feel it. You know, there's parts of your physical body that can easily be compared, and I'm writing a book. I know I've been promising this book for two years, but I'm really getting close to the end of it now. I've done more writing on it in 2024 than I did all 2023. So the Lord's helping me, and I've got a plan to finish it soon. It's called The Anatomy of the Soul, where I'm, showing, I'm going through the human body and showing you where God wrote his signature and DNA all through the human body. It's really quite fascinating. And one of the things that I've learned through this study is that parts of your anatomy reflect parts of your spirit. For instance, the Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Your, your respiratory system is also comparable to your breath in your body and, and your praise and worship. Have you ever noticed how when you praise, it just feels like a breath of fresh air? Have you ever just couldn't wait to get here on a Tuesday night and you get here and the glory of God comes in the room and it's like you're breathing. It's like, yes, I am so glad I'm here. I feel the, it's almost like walking outside on a cool evening and breathing in that nice cool air and your whole body feels refreshed that's what worship can do for you. That's what praise can do for you. So you can compare your worship to your respiratory system of taking a breath in your spirit. You can also compare your heart, which is easy to see, your physical heart to your spiritual heart. As a matter of fact, the Bible has a lot to say about from the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. He's not talking about this organ in my chest. He's talking about something more than that, a part of my soul. So I can compare my circulatory system to my compassion. You know, someone that is, that is loving and compassionate and kind, someone who loves to build the kingdom, that means they have a good heart. That's what we say about them. So you can compare your circulatory system to something where you're getting plenty of nourishment. You're getting plenty of everything. You're getting lots of oxygen. Therefore, your heart is making your body feel better. When you have a good heart, it makes your spirit feel lighter. How many of you know that to be true in your life? You can also compare your hands and feet to your service of the Lord. Have you ever used the phrase before, we are his hands and we are his feet? We can compare walking in the natural to walking in the spirit. We're walking in the love of God. We're, have you ever heard someone use the phrase? Well, it's a biblical phrase. Paul used it first, walking in love. Have you ever met someone who is not walking in love? How many of you wish they were walking in love? So there's a difference. So you're walking your feet. Natural walking is healthy for you. Walking in love is also healthy for you. Walking in compassion, walking in forgiveness, all of those things are healthy for your body. Even your mind, the brain inside of our head is compared to our will. The Lord, our, our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. So my thinking capacity is me submitting my will to God. So you can easily compare that to your body. Now, here's the thing about carrying weight. Carrying weight makes you vulnerable to sickness. Carrying extra weight stresses out parts of your body. Not just your, it stresses, it can stress your bones, it can stress your muscles, it can stress your breathing, it can stress your mind, it can give you brain fog. I mean, we can go on and on and on to the repercussions that can happen if you carry too much weight in your body. Well, the same thing is true in your spirit. It makes you vulnerable to spiritual sickness. Now, I, I'm not naive, guys. I am not a demon chaser. I've tell you that over and over and over, and I'll say that forever. I am not a demon. I'm an angel chaser. So I'm in, the, I'm in a different camp from that. I don't believe the devil's doing half the stuff people give him credit for, but the minute you give him credit, he starts doing it. The minute you open the, the door, now he really is in your house because you invited him in. So if you think everything's the devil, then you're just handing him an invitation. 
because, because you're speaking death instead of life. So I don't give the devil credit for anything. I don't give him credit for my flat tires. I don't give him credit for my stomach ache. I don't give the credit devil, I don't give the devil credit because I spent too much money and now I'm, you know, what I don't give him credit for all those things like some people do. Well, the devil is well, just an attack. I get so tired of that word. I just hear so many people who want to be spiritual but have no joy always saying attack, 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 attack. You keep saying it, you'll keep getting it. If you keep claiming attacks, you'll be under an attack for the rest of your life. Why don't you start using words like love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, kindness. Why don't you think on those things? If you think on those things, you become your surroundings around you. So you can open yourself up to attack by just simply embodying. On the same note, I'm not naive. I have been attacked by the devil. You have been attacked by the devil. There is a time that you know you're under a spiritual attack and you have to take an offensive posture and fight back, not a defensive posture. We never protect ourselves from the devil. We fight back because we have the power of the authority of Jesus' name and the blood of Jesus. We don't defend ourselves from Satan. We make Satan leave. We make him run. We have power over him since Calvary. He, our foot is on his head. That's what the promise was all the way back from Genesis. So, so when you are under a, a spiritual attack, take an offensive posture and fight back. Start quoting scriptures, put scriptures all over your house, anoint your doors, your doors with oil, turn, crank up the gospel music, walk around the house claiming to have, turn your sanctuary, turn your living room into a sanctuary and your kitchen into an altar call. You live like that, the devil doesn't hang around atmospheres like that very often. But if you got the woe is me song playing all the time, honey, get ready. You got horns in the door. He's already there. He's already buttoned up against you, man, because you're giving him an open invitation. Don't give him credit unless, unless the Lord reveals you you're under attack. You might just be a bad manager. Somebody needs to say it. Let's move on. <laughs> I'm glad we've, we're beyond the days of throwing rotten tomatoes and all that stuff, so thank the Lord. So. All right, so tonight we're going to deal with only two verses of the Bible. So I want you to go there in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. First thing I want to do is read it for you, and then I'm going to show you how it breaks down. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. That's the first phrase I want you to say out loud. Lay aside every weight. And the sin, you gotta see that. It's not a sin, it's not any sin, it's a particular sin. And the sin, everybody say the sin, which so easily ensnares us, and let us run, the, the, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Go on to the next verse. And verse 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, that's what you got to get your eyes on right there, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Now I want to break this down for you. We're going to talk about six things out of this verse, and I want to show you what those are. Jonathan, you'll put those up for me. I want to show you these six things that we're going to break down from this verse. There, there are several things I want you to notice, and if you, if you underline things in your Bible, l underline these things. We've got to lay aside, so I'm going to show you how to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to save that one for last, by the way. We're going to lay aside every weight, okay, every weight from the sin, now, it is a particular sin. It's not used, it's not the common word in the Bible for sin. That is why it's called the sin, not a sin or every sin. It would have just said every sin, but it's not. It's talking about a particular thing that happens in the body of Christ, and it causes us to be weighted down and easily ensnared. The weight of and the sin ensnares us. It catches us in a trap. It restricts us and binds us. 
and then it steals the joy of our future. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So you get this attitude that there's no joy left and no victories ahead, and you start getting your eyes on the past and, and, and the present, and you can't see the future. So that's the snare that Satan wants you in. And then it causes us to, to feel shame and makes us do shameful things. Who for the joy that was set before him, before him endured the cross, despising the shame because it was there and is now, there's the victory at the end, set down at the right hand of the throne of God. All right, so let's break this down and look at it. So the first thing I wanna talk about is one phrase. Let's go to the sin that so easily ensnares us. So I want you to look at this verse again and I wanna focus on just that one phrase, the sin which so easily ensnares us. That's what I wanna talk about. So leave that up there for just a moment because that's all I want us to think about for a moment, the sin. Now there's many New Testament words because we're reading from the New Testament. There's many New Testament words that are used to translate into the English word sin. As a matter of fact, there's 13 of them. And of those words, many of those are words that you could also translate into the word like kakos is a Greek word that literally means to do evil, all right? So, so panros is a Greek word that literally means to do malicious things. That means you're tearing things up and hurting people. It means malice and and the act of malice. So you're doing things that are hurting others. That's what malice means, by the way. That means that you're beyond talking about it. Now you're tearing things up. That means you're breaking things, including hearts. So that's when you get malice in you. That means when, you, when you're so out of control, you start tearing up material things. All right, so that's the word panros. But this is not any of those words. This is a different word called hamartria. And hamartria is a word that means one thing it means, put that up if you will, guys, it means offense. That's all it means. All right, so the sin is having offense in my spirit that I have never dealt with. That's what it means. That means if I am a born-again Christian and I speak in tongues every week and I go to global prayer every Thursday, and I come to church every Tuesday and Sunday and every revival I can find, but I have any unforgiveness in me toward anybody, that includes enemies and mother-in-laws and sisters and brothers and first and second and third cousins twice removed. That's everybody. But if, I have, if there's anybody that I hate, if there's anybody that I haven't forgiven. If there's anybody, then I am carrying in my spirit an extra weight. My spirit can never feel joy. It can never get free. I, I, I see people dancing, but it's just not in me. I say it's not my personality, but I dance other places, right? I do the electric slide, I just can't do that. I, I can't do either, but, uh, but you know what I'm saying? So we make all these excuses why I don't have the same joy that everybody else has. It's just not my, my person. No, your joy is a benefit of serving Christ. Joy gives you energy and strength. Well, that also means that you're gonna be deficient in love. And that means that love is gonna become conditional. I love you if you treat me right, but not if you don't. Unconditional love means you can't mistreat me enough to make me quit loving you. I may not like it, but I'm gonna love you anyway. And I'm gonna show you I love you because it's more than a commitment. I'm gonna love on you even when you can't love on me. Hard stuff. So, so if, I'm, if I have any kind of offense inside of me, it means I am weighted down somehow, some way, and now I'm easily ensnared. Uh-huh. You see that? I'm easily ensnared. Now Satan can trap me quicker than he can trap other people because he can push my button. He can call that name. He can, give, he, can, he can bring me right back to that moment and trigger me just like that, and I'm easily ensnared. What, what is the ensnarement? One thing, really, hopelessness. 
Because remember, this is about shame and future joy. So I don't see any future joy. I don't see any right hand of the Father. All I see is shame. So the minute you get ensnared, you instantly feel shame. We might call that low self-esteem. But it's shame. I'm ashamed of myself. And it's not because you're a bad person. It's because you, you have a weight that you cannot seem to get rid of that's hanging on to you. So carrying, a, carrying an offense is like carrying a weight. It's like walking around with this big boulder on your back or this weight on your back. And imagine that being your spirit. Not your body, but your spirit. And here I am, I'm, I'm hunched over, and I, I just, I, I have a hard time praying, and I have a hard time focusing, and, and I really don't enjoy reading the Bible, and I, and I really don't like people. I mean, let's be honest, that's part of it. I, I really don't like people, and I don't even like myself, and so I'm rude. I know there's no, that's an oxymoron. No Christians are rude. We all know that, right? No Christians are rude, especially not to waitresses and, you know, they're not rude. So, so I'm, I'm carrying this weight and this weight keeps slipping out in my character when I don't even know it's there. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just don't have any joy. I don't have any peace. I don't have any long suffering. Don't look at your neighbor right now, but ask yourself, do I have any long suffering? Just, it's just for you and God. You and God, straight ahead, straight ahead. Don't look at anybody. And please don't ask them. Do I have long suffering? It's a fruit of the Spirit. I mean, if, if you can speak in tongues, you should also have long suffering. Speaking in tongues is not a fruit of the Spirit. Long-suffering means you do have the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is evidence that you have the Holy Spirit. All right, let's keep going. I'll get stuck there. Now, we live in a world that's easily offended. How many of you would agree with that? Social media is a great tool for connecting with friends, but if you ever start connecting with, fr with strangers, you're going to find out real quick it's a breeding ground for the addiction of offense. I mean, they'll lay into you hiding behind some kind of fake name, and they'll lay into you. Go, every time you click on it, say, wonder what they've posted, and it's nothing. They don't have a picture. All they did is put somebody else's name on there so they could get on there and blast whatever they wanted to blast. And, it's, and so that's what happens a lot of times with social media. So, so if we have, here's the problem with our nation. I love this nation, and I'm waiting on revival to heal us, and I believe it's going to come. But what I, what I hate about this nation right now, one of the things that troubles me is we have now legalized offense, which means now if you offend me, I can do something about it. I can go to the court and do, because you offended me, I can do something about it. And what kind of world are we in when we have now legalized the fact that we're hurting people's feelings? Listen, you should have grown up in the old school like me. The teacher would have bent you over, cracked your rear end with a paddle, and then you would have gotten home and got it again. And then if two boys in the gym got offended, the coach would take you out back, put some boxing gloves on you, say, take care of it. The winner takes all. I mean, you know, you may think that sounds like violence, but that sounded like solutions to us back then. And guess what? We got over it. You didn't carry that around. We worked it out quick, and I'm not advocating that, so don't all the parents send me an email. You just told me to let my kids fight it out. Well, you know, it worked in my generation, but this is not my generation. So, so where, where, where do we go with this? Where do we go as Christians in the body of Christ where we're supposed to be separate and different from the world when everybody's offended? Now, you tell me, I'm going to name some groups. You tell me if you think they're offended. Republicans. <laughs> Democrats. Men. Women. Transgenders. Millennials. Baby boomers. Atheists. Agnostics. Muslims. Jews. Christians. Neighbors. 
Can you name anybody that's not offended? I mean, that's it. family. I mean, we can go there. It's like we have become addicted in this nation. The thing that is scary about this is that's not God's way. The thing that is scary about this is that he's called us to a different plane of living. He has given us the power of the Holy Spirit to guide us and let us live above this entrapment of offense. I'm going to say something that I don't hear anybody say in the pulpit now unless they say it mad. And I'm not mad, so I'm just going to say it glad. You may not agree with what I'm about to say, but I'm going to say it, and then you can go out and say what you want to say. Or next time you get in your pulpit, you can just say what you want to say. So here's what I'm going to say because I believe it. Racism is a sin. That's what I believe. I believe it's a sin. I don't believe you can find it. I know people got scriptures and all kinds of things and mom and papa and all this. Listen, if you read the Bible and you understand Christianity, especially life in Christ, the abundant life and the fruit of the Spirit in the New Testament church, you have to believe. There's an entire chapter in the New Testament Philemon that was written to set a slave free and invite him into the church as a brother. The whole book is there to say he is one of us. He was born into slavery, but he is a member of our family, and I want you to relinquish the, the jurisdiction laws against him and bring him back to me, Paul said, because I need him in the ministry because he's my brother. That's what the whole book of Philemon is about. So I realize that our nation is still paying for the awful atrocities of our forefathers. And I realize that slavery was abolished 159 years ago before anyone in this room or anyone listening to me was born. Even probably before most of your parents were born. But, and I understand that slavery is a crime. I get that. I believe all of that. But the remnant of this horrible part of our history has left a residue of racial hatred in our land that the church cannot be a part of. We have to take the side of Christ. We will, you know, I don't want to stand before God with racial hatred in my heart. I don't want to stand on judgment day and, and say, but, but I, this was my excuse. No, we're going to be judged out of the words of our mouth, and we're going to be judged out of the thoughts of our mind and our hearts, and we're going to be judged out of the word of God. And that is why today in our country we have black people being mistreated by white people, but that's not where it stops. We have a lot of white people being mistreated by black people, and we've got to stop this in the body of Christ. It's a two-way thing. It's not just a minority thing. It's a hatred thing. Yes, I understand there's more in a majority and less in a minority, and every minority deserves equal rights across the board. I do not argue that point. But hatred is wrong no matter what color you are. Hatred is wrong, and mistreating people is wrong for every single color on the planet. You cannot make excuses because of your color saying that that gives me a right to hate other people. Indians have been mistreated and hold resentment in this land. Immigrant workers from Latin America and India and Asia have been mistreated and are still in pain from minority treatment. Not in this land, but in lands across the world. We have mistreated people because they're different from us. But the way I understand it, every person with a different skin pigment from yours and a different culture and a different accent, if I understand the Bible, they are still my brothers and my sisters. If I believe the Bible is true, if you're from African descent or Anglo descent or Hispanic or Asian or First Nations people of this na of America, if you're the Indians from India or from North Dakota or, or New Mexico or wherever you're from, if you're from the Middle East, if you're Jewish, if you're Arab, if you're Russian, and you are, if you're Eskimo, if you're European descent, if you're an Islander, if you have come to the cross of Jesus Christ. You are my brother and you are my sister if you have come to Jesus Christ. 
And we have got to give up hatred in the name of skin pigment and mistreatment and misinformation that has been broadcast to our youth from one to another, telling them all people, stereotyping everybody because of the mistreatment of one person. Racism is wrong and Christians should not practice it. Are you guys still with me tonight? I realize that's something a lot of pulpits aren't saying today, but I just felt like the Holy Spirit wanted me to say it tonight. Is that all right with you? You're my brother, you're my sister, so take me by the hand. Together, we will work until he comes. And if that one doesn't do it for you, Jesus loves the little children, all the little children of the world, red, yellow, black, and white. They are precious in his sight because Jesus loves the little children of the world, and so do I. Amen. So do I. All right. The whole world seems to be offended. Vegetarians are offended. <laughs> Vegans are offended. I know I, I said this uh, last year in one of my sermons, but it's still ridiculous. I had to read it again. New York Times article dated 12-4-2018. It states that vegans are now rallying for the removal of meat-based metaphors like bring home the bacon, <laughs> and they're rallying for it to be replaced with bring home the broccoli. So if you wanna start bringing home the broccoli, you go right ahead, I'm gonna keep bringing home the bacon. Twitter crowds offended, Facebook crowds offended, Instagram crowds offended, and I don't care what you say anymore, you're gonna TikTok somebody off. You know that to be true. It's just gonna happen. That's just where we are in our country today. So what do we do about that? Do we just go with it? No. We are called out. We are the ecclesia, the called out ones to show forth the glory of the Lord. We have to be separated from the issues of society and be the body of Christ in this world that we live in today. That is why Matthew says in Matthew 24 and 10, he said that that's one of the signs of the time. He said, and then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another. Do you know that's, that's as much of a sign as the time as, as wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes in diverse places? One of the signs that Jesus is about to return is that the whole world is easily offended and there's hatred everywhere you turn. That is a part of the body, that is a part of the family of God or the part of the scripture. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do two more things and then I'm gonna close, all right? So I'm still, I gotta go back to my verse. First of all, we gotta talk about the cause of this. Why do people get ensnared? Why is there a sin, the sin of offense, that ensnares us? I wanna say this very plain. If you carry offense, everything is gonna offend you. You're gonna read into every room you're in. They're talking about me. They're saying that about me. And they're really not. It's just paranoia in your mind because you have not gotten rid of your offense. And if you, so the cause of this, why do people carry an offense even though they know it's damaging them? Here's the first thing. They have a pain that has not been healed. I just want to say this because Chris Goins is in the house tonight, and Faith and I have been to lots of marriage conferences, but the one you did here this weekend is the best one we've ever been to. It's the best one, and we've been to lots of them. We love marriage. We love family, and so we've gone to lots, and we'll go to lots more, but I've never been to one that good because you dealt with the real issues. You dealt with the pain and you gave us tools to get out of that pain. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna quote you tonight a little bit later on, but I'm not gonna give you credit. <laughs> I'm gonna say the Lord showed me this and then I'm gonna tell it the way it is. You say, if you're at the marriage conference, you'll recognize if you weren't, you'll say, boy, that Dr. B is really on tonight. <laughs> the first reason people carry offense is because they have a pain that's not been healed. They, they're triggered easily. There's something in their heart that is still hurting because they've never been able to release it. The second reason that people carry offense is because 
at one time of their life, they've been betrayed by someone they loved. And now they have PTSD, post-traumatic syndrome disorder, which means that every time the enemy wants to shut them down, he shows them that scene. Chris was very vulnerable with us in this marriage conference and actually told us what scene the enemy uses to try to come against him. I've never heard anyone be that transparent. It was an amazing moment because it set a lot of people free. Because you know what I was thinking? I know what my scenes are. And you know what you're thinking right now? You know what your scenes are. There are scenes in your life that are so heartbreaking that when you think about them, if you dwell on them, it shuts you down just like that. And then your mind goes to places it shouldn't go. One of the things you have to do is, well, I'll tell you the cure in a minute. Let's still talk about the cause. The next thing is shame. People that carry offense also carry shame. Shame that they didn't necessarily want. Here's the thing, when you get hurt sometimes, you do things that you're ashamed of and you realize that you're part of the cause. And you have to admit that at some point in time, I'm ashamed of this. And, and <laughs> there is there now for, I you know, I'm not a big crier, but I wish I was right now because I would love to cry as I say this to you. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. I want you to hear that. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. He bore your shame so that you don't have to. I don't care what you did, and I don't care what was done to you. You're not naked anymore. You are covered by the blood, and you are covered by the lamb, and you are covered by the name of Jesus. We've all probably have regrets in our life. I know that I do. Things, moments I wish I could take back. Don't you just wish you had 10 seconds not to send that email? Don't you wish you had five seconds not to engage in that conversation? Don't you wish that there was just one moment that you would have said no instead of yes? I mean, a, a two-second point in your life that if you would have said no instead of yes, your whole life would be different. We all have those, but you gotta quit thinking about it, and you gotta quit living in it, and you've gotta quit going back there. That is a graveyard. Go ahead and bury it, put a tombstone on it, and let it die. Don't keep it alive, don't keep it alive. The more you talk about it, you keep it alive. You've gotta let it go. And then the last one is disrespect. I wanna do a test tonight. Don't raise your hand if it embarrasses you, but I want everybody that's ever been disrespected to raise your hand. All right. The rest of you need to be the first one to the altar. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I think everybody raised their hand. Did you see what just happened, guys? There's not a person here, and there's 10,000 online that are all raising their hands. Every, it's not just you. It's not just you. I'm gonna say something that a counselor said to me years ago, a long time ago actually, and it set me free. I wish he had said it earlier, but he didn't. This is what he said to me. Brian, you know what your problem is? You feel sorry for yourself. And I got so mad when he said that. I thought, sorry, I'm about to wad you up and stick you in my pocket because I'm twice your size and I ain't going there. He pushed a button I wasn't ready for because he was right. I had a fence in me that I could not get rid of, and it caused me to wallow in self-pity. And I want to tell everybody that's listening to my voice tonight, self-pity is not your friend. And if you have to tell your story and exaggerate it over and over just to get people to feel sorry for you, you're taking the wrong medicine. That's the wrong drug for you because it never heals, it never stops, and you just gotta tell it to 10 more people. And if that's how you're easing your pain, you're going about it the wrong way because you can't get healed that way. Self-pity is not your friend. All right, that's the cause. What are the effects of this? First effect is victim mindset. If you think you are a victim, then you are. If you don't think you are a victim, 
then you're not. I'm going to say that again. It's the truth. You don't have to have anybody to work that out of you. Now, yeah, you might have to have some issues to get through some processes, but I want to tell you something. The minute you quit thinking you are a victim, you are no longer victimized. But as long as you think you're a victim, you will forever be victimized, and you will read into every conversation, and you'll see things that really doesn't exist, and you're going to make things happen because you don't realize that you're the one that actually made it happen. No one else made it happen. You sabotaged your own self because you were victim think you have victim thinking. So the cause of this is victimization. You still with me? I know I'm usually more of a camp meeting style. Well, not always, but I'm a more of a revivalist. Tonight, I am pastor and I am teacher, and I hope it's sitting home tonight. This is what the Lord gave me to say, and I hope it's, I hope it's getting to all of us. Here's the other thing. The cause and effect of carrying offense is paranoia. You get paranoid. You get scared when you don't need to be scared. You start thinking people are saying things when they're not saying any of it. It's just your, your own mind making it up because you haven't gotten it out of your heart. You start reading into things. Here's the other thing. You start mistreating others and taking advantage of others and you don't even realize it. I learned something years ago. I'm not going to go into my story, but I'm just going to say there were some things in my life I didn't want to repeat. But because I didn't know how to do it right, and I only knew how to do it wrong, that's the way I did it. I hated it. I didn't want to do it wrong. I just didn't know how to do it right. And I was driving on the, on the road one time, and something caught my attention on the right, and I swerved, and the Holy Spirit said to me, you will always move toward what you see. And that simple little thing from the Holy Spirit set me free, and I said, then I'm going to start looking at something else. And I started finding mentors. I started reading books. And I mean, I was on an av I was reading a book a week, one book every week. I did it for years. I would read an entire book every single week on certain subjects because I said, I'm going to set my mind on other things. I'm tired of stinking thinking. I'm tired of thinking about the past. I'm going to put my mind someplace else. I'm going to put my mind on good things, whatsoever is good and lovely, and I'm going to think on those kind of things, and that's a discipline. If you don't know how to do it right, you'll end up doing it wrong because it's the only one you know. So learn it. You have 10,000 teachers. This is my first sermon of the year. You have 10,000. There's no excuse that you can't learn it. Break the habit and learn it. It only takes 30 days to break a habit. You start distrusting everyone. That's another effect. You know where that leads to? You may not want to admit it. You may not want to ever say it out loud, but this is the truth. Distrusting people leads to distrusting God. You may not want to ever believe that, but if you really check your spirit, you'll say, because I don't trust anybody or anything, I really have a hard time trusting God. That's an effect of carrying this weight. And finally, well, two more things. There is control. If I can control my circumstances, I can keep myself from getting hurt. So what I'll do is I'll just control every, everything around me and then nobody can hurt me because I'm in charge and you become a bully. It's because there's pain that is not, that is not getting rid of. I realize some of this stuff is, I don't know if it's an oh me or an oh yay or God, I hope they're listening. But I hope you're hearing what the Lord is saying. And here's the last thing, and this is probably the worst of all because it's the cancer of the spirit, bitterness. Pursue peace. This is Hebrews 12. It's still in the same chapter, but I'm going down a couple of verses and picking them up. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Let's keep going. Looking carefully lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble. And by this, I want everybody to read the rest of that. And thereby many become defiled. If I let bitterness get inside of me, do you know what the Bible actually calls? It's the only time the word cancer is used in the Bible, but the Bible actually calls bitterness cancer. Always, it actually calls it that. And can't, bitterness is the cancer of your soul. It doesn't just stay in one place. It eats everything out. It's trying to kill you. 
because it wants you to always, always see everything from anyone's perspective but God's. All right. Woo, I'm glad that's over. I now get to talk about how to get rid of it. I'm glad I made it through that. Thank the Lord. Aren't you glad I didn't just dismiss and send you home? You'd go home depressed. It's like, oh, woe is me. Here am I, God. I'm standing in the need of prayer. All right. So let's go back to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, and I know what time it is. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Now look at this. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. So now we want to talk about how do I get rid of this? How do I get rid of this sin of offense that's inside of me? So I'm gonna give you something that hopefully will be easy to remember. It's the word fall, and this is what it stands for. The cure for offense is fall. Forgive, ask for help, live in the present, and lay it down, all right? So forgive, ask for help, live in the present, and lay it down. How do I get rid of my offenses? The first thing you have to do is forgive. Now, the Lord gave me something that is absolutely brilliant, and I want to give it to you. Forgiveness is not minimizing the pain or excusing the person. Amen, Pastor Chris? The Lord gave this to me. <laughs> Forgiveness is not ignoring the problem or pretending that it's okay. Amen, Pastor Chris? The Lord gave this to me. Forgiveness is not forgetting about what happened doesn't mean it didn't happen. Forgiveness is not, and this is what I always thought it was, but I was wrong, reconciliation. Because you forgive does not mean you're gonna ever get reconciled with that person, and you might not want to get reconciled with that person. You might just rather forget it and move on. Man, how many of you know there's some people that just don't belong in your life anymore? They, they just don't. You gotta, you gotta move on without them. So forgiveness is not an Oprah Winfrey reunion. <laughs> forgiveness is not reconciliation. Forgiveness is not the immediate restoration of trust. Doesn't mean that I forgive you now I can trust you. No, you can forgive people and still not trust them. Forgiveness is not the, re the immediate restoration of trust. Rebuilding trust is a process. Here is what forgiveness is. And the Lord gave this to me, it's wonderful. Forgiveness looks like this, recognizing the humanity of the person who hurt you. There were some people in my life that I could not forgive for a long time. My wife knows exactly what I'm talking about, two people in my life who could not forgive for a long time until the Lord put me on an assignment that I didn't even want to do. I had to write something for a, a book and I didn't even want to do it. And they asked me to do it, and I thought, if I don't, you know, I needed to do it. So I wrote something, and when I wrote that for that book, for the very first time in my life, ever in my life, I saw their pain. I'd never even considered their pain. I only knew the pain they caused me. And the first time in my life, and that was healing for me. The fact that I could recognize the humanity in them set me free. I knew I wasn't perfect, but I thought they did a lot of things they did on purpose, and they didn't. Sometimes you're doing the best you can do, and you don't have the tools to do it right. So sometimes your healing comes when you recognize that's forgiveness, the humanity of the other person. Forgiveness looks like this, remembering how much you've been forgiven by God. Boy, that one hits me right between the eyes. God, if, if you can forgive me, that's what the Lord's prayer ends with, you know. You know, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation and forgive us our, and, and you know the rest of it, right? We started trespasses, but for, forgive us as, forgive. somebody help me out. I say this every week at Global Prayer. I lead this prayer in the beginning of Global Prayer. Let me say it slow. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Who knows the next verse? The next verse says, your heavenly Father, if you do, no, it says this, if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you for your trespasses. That's the next verse. So God, you're gonna forgive me the way I forgive them. I didn't write it, I'm just reading it. Remembering how much God has forgiven me makes it much easier for me to forgive somebody else. Here's the next thing that forgiveness looks like that the Lord gave me. Relinquishing your right to get even. Boy, that's a hard one, isn't it? I mean, don't you know if you could just get even, you'd think you'd feel better. Has anybody ever gotten even and you didn't feel better? You thought it would do something that it just didn't do? That, that's the lie. That's the part of the ensnarement. No, you're relinquishing your right to get even. Lord, this is what I have to say. God, you're the judge. I'm not the judge. You'll do what's right. I, I, it's not up to me to bring any justice. It's up to you to bring justice, and I trust you to bring justice. Here's the next thing that forgiveness looks like. Responding to evil with good. I know I've forgiven when I can do something good for you. And are forgiven when I don't want you to suffer. I don't want you to be my friend, maybe. I don't even want you to have my email address. But I just can now say, may the Lord bless and keep you. May the Lord let his light shine on you and be gracious to you. Maybe I can say that now. And I've gotten beyond the point of, oh, God, rain down great balls of fire from heaven, destroy their crops. And, you know, maybe I've gotten beyond that part. I know I'm the only one that's ever prayed a prayer like that, but <laughs> I have, although I'll be honest, I have. And here's another thing that forgiveness looks like, repeating the process as long as many times you have to. That means I forgave you, but now I'm here again. I gotta do it again. I, I thought it was over, but the enemy's brought it back up, so I'm gonna go through it again. I forgive you in Jesus' name. Have you ever had to pray the prayer of forgiveness more than once over the same thing? That's what you have to do to get free. All right, that's the F. The, the others are very short. Ask for help. You have 10,000 teachers. That's what the Lord promised you. You have 10,000 instructors in Christ, in Christ, and you also have fathers and mothers. You have books, you have media, you have resources, you have counselors. You have to ask for help. Don't try to do it on your own. You may not make it. Ask for help. Fall. Forgive. Ask for help. The next L. Boy, Faith and I practice this one, and we talk about this a lot. Live in the present, not the past. That means if I'm upset, I can't be upset about something that happened 10 years ago. I'm upset about something that just happened 10 minutes ago. That's okay. Okay. If I'm living in the present, but what I can't do is bring up something from 10 years ago to make my point for something that happened 10 minutes ago. That's what I can't do. So I have to get current. I have to live in the present. What does the Bible say about Christians? Old things are what? Well, if God said that, why are we doing it? Perry preaches a great sermon on fishing in the sea of forgetfulness. I'll never forget that, the sea of forgiveness, rather. I'll never forget that sermon fishing in the sea of forgiveness, and that God says there is a punishment for it. So if God says let go of the past, all things are passed away, we have to do that. Here's the next thing. You have to say, this is, this is the phrase I use for myself. That was then, this is now. That's what I say. It's not the same. That was then. That was something else. That was somebody else. This is now. This is who I am now. This is who we are now. This is what our life is now. That was then. This is now. I'm going to live in the now. I can't live in the then. Because you're different. Everybody's different. 
And then lay it down is the last one. I want to ask the musicians to come. Many years ago, I was leading a men's retreat in St. Louis. And this men's retreat, we dealt a lot with forgiveness. And that's a, not the easiest topic among men. You know, guys, we're tough exteriors. We live on the surface. We don't really open up a lot easy. We don't open up easily, even at home sometimes. We, it takes a lot to get us to really be vulnerable. You know, that's the man's world. You just have to, you know, girls are giving dolls to hug and hold. We're giving guns and trucks when we're kids. Tells us you're going to have to do, protect people the rest of your life and work. So we grew up with that mindset. We don't grow up with holding baby dolls and doing domestic things in the playhouse kitchen. That's not how we work. And a guy, it's, 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 it's competition. If you're two years old, your daddy wants you to outrun the other two-year-old. You know what I'm saying? It's true. You got to climb. My boy can climb that tree faster than your boy. My grandfather put a set of boxing gloves on me and put me in a ring with three other boys and said, you whip them or I'm going to whip you. I gave it all I had. I don't know who won that fight, but I'm telling you what, I went out there swinging with everything I had. My grandfather did that to me. So guys aren't the easiest guys to open up. We've been taught to build walls. We're at this men's retreat. We're talking about, you know, getting rid of your past. I gave some illustrations of things I've done in my life. You've heard me tell my story of the journal and putting it in the dumpster and things like that. Well, this particular retreat, we were out by a lake um, out over in Illinois, Carlisle Lake. And every man had a set of smooth stones, like five smooth stones. We talked about David and talked about these smooth stones and killing your Goliath. Everybody had a magic marker beside of it. And what we ask them to do is write the names of people they need to forgive or incidences that they need to forgive on those smooth stones. So they wrote those down and we went out to the end of a dock and there was probably a hundred men or maybe more at this retreat. And so we waited. And the idea behind it was you walk down to the end of the dock, you throw your stones and when you come back, all the men cheered. That's what we did. No one said a word when you walked down there. It was very quiet. You walked down there, you took all the time you want, and we'd see these big guys, and they'd throw those stones. Some of them had several stones. I won't say this person's name because he watches me, and I'm still in touch with him a lot, but uh, he knows who he is, and this is a part of his story. It was a young guy, and I knew his childhood story. It wasn't a good story. I knew the brokenness inside of him over and over and over by all kinds of people. This kid was talented and smart, but broken. And I'll never forget him walking out to the end of that dock. And he took a stone. And right before he threw it, he dropped to his knees and began to weep so loud, every man heard it. He couldn't throw it. He cried like a child. This is a big dude. He cried like a little boy. It was like all the brokenness inside of him was coming out. And we thought he would get up, but he didn't. He, he knelt there. The next thing I know, he is laying flat. There's still other guys waiting to throw their stones, but this guy hasn't gotten up. And I, I saw something that day that I'll never forget as long as I live. Several men that were his friends walked down to that dock and they picked him up and they hugged him and held him and then they said let me help you throw this stone and they put their hand in his hand and they threw those stones and he collapsed again on the floor and they said don't worry brother we got you and they picked him up and carried him off that dock while a hundred men cheered because he was able to lay it down. It was one of the most powerful deliverance moments I've ever witnessed in my life. You know this, I hate to use this illustration after that illustration, but it's one you'll get. And honestly, I don't know the words to this song. I just know this line of it. 
a famous Disney song that I've heard my granddaughter sing calls it Let It Go. And they can sing it to the top of their lungs and they know every word. I don't know every word, but I can sing, let it go, let it go, and then I'm lost. I don't know, it's kind of like when I quote the Lord's Prayer real fast, you know, it just, I have to slow it down to remember it. So I'm, I'm hearing my granddaughter singing this song and they tell me it's from a show called Frozen. And I said, what does it mean? If you don't let it go, Papa, you'll get frozen. I said, man, that's a sermon if I've ever heard one. <laughs> if you don't let it go, you will get frozen. I was gonna, I was gonna end another way, but I'm not gonna do that tonight. I wanna sing a song, and this is what I want you to do. I know we typically invite for the prayer team to come, but I don't know when the last time you have just come to the altar by yourself and prayed without anybody praying with you, anybody bothering you, you just laid it down. Fall, forgive. You gotta live in the present. You gotta live in the present. You have to ask for help and you have to lay it down. But what you cannot do is live your life carrying this weight or you will get easily ensnared and bound by everything. There's some tough guys in this room tonight. The Holy Spirit wants me to tell you, you need to fall. You need to lay it down. There's some tough women in this room tonight. The Holy Spirit wants me to tell you, you need to lay it down. So in just a moment, we're going to sing a song. I want you to sing, I Surrender All. It's an old song, but this is the song I really want us to sing. I'm going to ask you to stand if you are right now, and this is what we're going to do tonight. It's going to be a little different. I know we have prayer teams, and we usually pray that way. I will say this. If a member of the prayer team feels led by the Holy Spirit to pray with someone, you have the liberty to do that. I don't want you to feel like you have to, but you have the liberty to do that. Guys, I know the temptation is, it's, it's only 8.30. I know the temptation is, let's let the prayer get started and we can get out here and beat the traffic. I, I, I get that. Please don't miss this moment. The Holy Spirit has set you up, even though you may not know it, to come and fall in His presence. You know why we have altars? Because we have to lay something on them. It's a place of surrender. So as they sing this song, I Surrender All, I want as many people, and there's a lot of people in this room tonight, but I want as many people over this building that says, Holy Spirit, you're talking to me. I don't want to carry a fence. I, I don't want to think like that. And all of us have done it, guys. We all have buttons. I might be the first one in there tonight because I don't want the devil to have anything on me. I want to be outrunning him. So if the Lord has spoken to you in any part of this word tonight, it could be any part of it, and you know that's for you. In Jesus' name, get out of your seat and come and find a place to pray in the altar. Let's sing it together. I surrender all. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. plenty of room just find you a place to pray if you need to pray on the front rows you can do that too This is a place to lay it down. Hallelujah. 